Hello and welcome to the Strong Men Podcast. I'm Anthony Treas from strongmancoaching.com, where I support men in their health, wealth, and personal performance. Today, I am with Stephen Gardner. He is the author of several books. However, his latest book, Taming Wall Street, where he shares financial strategies for people to keep their money in their pockets. Stephen, welcome to the Strong Men Podcast. Thank you, Anthony. I'm excited to be on here with you today. Well, thank you, Stephen. And I'm excited to, you know, your book, Taming Wall Street, was fascinating. And I'm not sure if you remember, but when we were discussing a possible topic for this show, I said, hey, let's talk about investing. And I get a reply from you and it kind of went something like, I think I have something better. <laughs> and, and, and you were right. <laughs> and after going through your book, I'm excited. So let's get into your story. Like, what do you do and how can people stop losing their earned money? So I got involved in finance back in 2003. So about 16 years ago, but it wasn't until the Great Recession when all of a sudden I saw my own 401k fall by 38%. And that was a major wake up call because it was like watching years and years of my money just vanish. And nobody likes that feeling <laughs> if they've no. lived through that or they've you know had money stolen from them, something like that. And even though I was involved in insurance and uh, retirement planning, it was the first time that I really set out to learn for myself, not just what the companies were sharing with me or the contracts that I had secured, but if I were to go at this from ground zero, where would I go? And I became a voracious reader and just started learning more about real estate investing and mutual funds. And, and all, all, I mean, there's a million different ways to grow your money. Some of them good, most of them not good. And what happened was for one of the topics of Tammy Wall Street is a friend of mine invited me. He said, hey, I want you to come to the seminar tonight with me and you'll have to take work off tomorrow. And I was like, nah, I don't really want to do that. And he said, and it's $100. Mm -hmm. I'm like, okay, man, I don't know what this is. And you've got to buy this $25 book. And I was like, I don't think so. Catch me on the next one. He said, okay, I'll tell you what, I'll buy your ticket if you'll buy the book. And you've got to take a day off. But he said, I'm telling you, I think that you'll like this, just knowing your personality and your background in finance. And so I went to the seminar and I tell you what, I left that seminar, Anthony, and I told my wife, one day I'm going to make this my full-time pursuit. I mean, it, it was such a paradigm shift mm. for me on how to take control of your money, make sure that if something happens to you, that an instant estate of tax-free money is created for your family and your children. But if you live, which is what we hope, then you have control and liquid access to that money. And then as, as you read in the book, I show people how to recover the money that they typically lose on cars. Mm -hmm. You can do real estate flipping or rental properties. I, I've done all of that with my own money and my clients across the country. But it's a way to earn interest in two places at the same time. It's the only financial vehicle that allows you to do that. And it's all completely tax-free as of right now under the tax code. It's been that way for over 100 years, so I don't see that changing. But that's what really opened my eyes was just out of necessity from losing such a large percentage of my own money. You mentioned a couple of things that, are, that I know would perk people's ears, right? Or is tax-free, more control of your money. And when I was reading through this, I was like, and the examples that you used, I'm sure everyone, you know, an adult who, who's been, you know, has lived on earth for a while can relate to it in, in purchasing cars, wanting a boat, these certain things. And when you start looking at these numbers and how math does not lie, right? Yeah. And so when you start looking at these things and I'm looking at these examples that you're like, wait, I've bought in several cars, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I'm thinking of all the money that I have lost, I guess, or used, and how it could have been much better, especially in these examples that you have shared. Let's get into it. What is this strategy? Funny enough, when I take someone who's interested in becoming a client of mine through the math mm -hmm. on, on their own car, 
they go, okay, you're not teaching me anything new. I've seen this on every car. And I say, okay, now let me show you my way. Mm. And then I walk them through being their own source of finance, Mm. earning interest on their money the entire time they're using it to purchase the car. And they're like, okay, hold on. You need to do the math one more time. (laughs) And I I say, listen, you can't lie with the numbers. And I, Mm -hmm. I walk them through it again. So basically what it is, is we're going to take a very specialized type of life insurance Mm -hmm. and we're not using it for the death benefit. The death benefit will be there. That's kind of the ancillary prize, but you don't really get to benefit from that. Your family does, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're looking for are the living benefits of insurance, not the death benefit, right? And so I will build that in a way that will max fund the cash side of these plans because there's an insurance side and there's a cash bank account side. And what we're going to do is overfund that. And everybody's different. I have clients that start with a couple hundred dollars a month up to, I have a guy that puts a quarter of a million a year into these plans because he sees the value of not losing to taxes and inflation and and market loss. And so once you have a stockpile of money, instead of going to the bank, and borrowing that money and paying interest for the right to use that money, we're going to borrow from ourselves. And these insurance companies that I use, not all of them, there's only a few left that do this, but the one that I use, they allow you to borrow that money, but your money continues to earn interest as if it were never gone because technically it isn't gone. They're Mm -hmm. going to use your money as collateral and they're going to lend you from the company account, and then you're going to pay that back. But I don't want to get too technical or granular, but when you pay it back, it pays back faster than a traditional loan. But the real juice, the steroids that makes this thing continue to grow is it keeps growing as if the money were never gone. And that's the power of the program. And most people have never heard of that because Wall Street doesn't want you to know about this. Before the invention of the 401k, over 50% of all Americans' money was with insurance companies. And now that has fallen to a pitiful amount and everybody is gambling on Wall Street. And so you, you just have to be very, very careful. Anybody that's been on Wall Street knows I'm not making this up. You can win money in Wall Street and you can also lose and it can be very, very devastating. So in respect to what we're talking about now, Anthony, you can answer on behalf of your listeners. When you take money out of your pocket to make a car payment, do you ever see that money again? No, it gets taken out of my account and it's gone. It's gone, right? So with traditional financing, you take money out of your pocket and you give it to the bank. With what I'm showing people is you take money out of your pocket and you stick it in your other pocket. You own the money, right? And so it just goes back in. But all the meanwhile, that lump sum of money that you borrowed to go buy the truck or the car or the Tesla or whatever it is, that continues to earn interest and it's compound interest and it will continue to grow for you even while your money is out in the real world holding the place of this car that you now get to own. Yeah, and that's what's so fascinating with this because many people now in savings, right, they're using Roth IRAs, they're using 401ks, and there's restrictions on those, right? And there's not- There's a cap on how much you can put in and there's a cap on how much you can earn. So if you're a high earner in the United States, the government slaps you for that with higher taxes and they restrict you from those tax advantage programs. So let's say, you know, someone's listening and they're like, okay, I have my money and my Roth IRAs and the 401ks. Would you say for someone to someone to keep it that way or is there something they can do to better their situation? Well, yeah, you can't cross mingle of these. So if someone has money in an old 401k or an IRA, then we're going to look at the second strategy in Taming Wall Street, which is the growth focused strategy where we get away from those fees that eat into your money. We get away from the market loss and get you over into a program that has a very good track record of growing your money. So with qualified money, we're going to go a different route. Now, sometimes people will say, man, now that I understand this be my own source of financing method, I'm going to stop contributing to my 401k or my IRA. I don't tell people to do that, but 
it is something that people can do. Or if somebody has a 401k, I tell people, hey, if you're getting a match, why don't you pay up to the match? Because mm. nothing, there's no money better than free money. Yes. If you're an employer, right? So it's like free money and then money that you don't have to pay tax on. Those would be like the top two forms of money. Yeah. And so get that free money, but anything above and beyond that, you're really just compounding your future tax burden. And unfortunately, I've had to break the news to a lot of people. I spoke to a gentleman the other day. He was so proud of being a millionaire, a 401k millionaire. Yeah, he said it so many times during our conversation. And I said, well, you realize you still owe about 400000 to the government. So you really only have about 600000 that's yours. Hmm. And he was like, what? And I said, you've never paid tax on the principal or on the earnings. Hmm. And he's like, oh my gosh, I totally forgot. And that's what Wall Street wants. They've collaborated with the government. How do we get money tied up till 59 and a half? And the only outlet is Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And so with what I'm showing you, I'm not saying to completely ditch Wall Street. I think that there's, there's value in the stock market, especially with these growth focused programs that I show people with their qualified money. But it's important to have some of your money inside of something that will never be taxed again. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can ask every single person that I talk to, are you diversified? And they'll say, I'm trying to diversify. And I say, okay, are you diversified with your future taxes? And they say, nobody has ever talked to me about that. Mm -hmm. Well, we're $22 trillion in debt with over $100 trillion of unfunded liabilities for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. So if you think that taxes aren't going to be higher in the future, you're just being too optimistic. Mm -hmm. They have to be paid back at some point. And so you've got to have some of your money growing inside of something, whether it's a Roth IRA or what I teach people, you've got to be very conscious of the fact that you don't want to become 70 years old, out of work, living off of your nest egg, and you still owe Uncle Sam whatever amount of money he determines he wants to take from you. And that's a big point is the government decides how much of your money they own. What would you say to someone who's in their 30s who hasn't started saving? Perhaps they haven't got into a Roth IRA or a 401k. What would you say to someone in their 30s? Is it the same strategy for someone in their 40s and 50s that you would suggest? It's a little bit different. I would tell them to get very good at saving. I have an article on the street, Jim Cramer's website, about how you can't save your way to wealth. And I truly believe that. But you also can't invest until you start saving. Mm. And so if you're just getting started, let's go back to the basics. Let's start systematically saving as much as you can every month. I'm not like Dave Ramsey. I don't believe you should live on rice and beans. I mean, life should be enjoyed. We only get so many years on the planet, but become a good saver. But then you've got to decide where you want to put that money. Do you want to retain control of it or do you want somebody else to? Do you want it to be taxed in the future or untaxable? So I, I would say Let's get you educated on the different strategies that are out there, but be very careful who you choose as a mentor and who you're getting your education material from. For example, a bank is not going to tell you to go into Wall Street because they sell banking products. They're also not going to tell you to go into insurance because they sell banking products. Mm. Same thing. Wall Street is trying to extract money away from banks. There's $9 trillion sitting in bank products that aren't even keeping up with inflation, but they're safe. And so Wall Street is trying to extract that money, you know, romanticize it away by telling people, hey, we're not as dangerous as you think, and mm. the fees aren't what you think, and you're going to get 8 9 10%. They can promise it all day long, but outside research firms will tell us that it's significantly less than whatever they are advertising. So I would just say to somebody in their 30s, let's get you becoming a good saver, and then you can put that money to work. But here, here's one thing that I will point out. Most Americans will spend more money on cars in their lifetime than they will ever save for themselves. And so if that's true, if I can show you a system that allows you to take control of your car purchasing and the, the end result is you end up with more money, then why not flow that money that has been going away from you, have reverse the flow and have it come back to you and end up with hundreds of thousands of tax-free dollars 
for money you were going to spend on a car anyway. Same thing with real estate investing. You know, many people want to get into that, but that takes either really good relationships and other people's money, or it takes using your own money and it takes time to save and build that nest egg. Why not do it in the strategy I teach? And then when you borrow that money out to go flip a piece of real estate or buy a rental, the entire time it's out working for you in real estate, it's also continues to earn uninterrupted inside of your plan. I mean, it's a beautiful relationship once you fully understand what I'm sharing. So is this the same for someone who's in their 40s or 50s, or it really kind of depends if they have money already? Yeah, I, I would say from my own clientele, by the time somebody hits 60, this strategy, that point, they start putting it on their children and their grandchildren. Okay. They still own the money. They still own the, the methodology but they're using somebody else's life as collateral. And then that ends up being a blessing to the family down the road when they pass anyway, except for that it's tax-free, right? But once somebody gets to that age and I'm meeting them, at that point, they've got money in a 401k or an IRA. And that's when we go with the second strategy that's described in, in Taming Wall Street. So everybody that I work with, has a uh, different material to work with and we, yes. we build a custom suit out of whatever material they have to work with. You mentioned saving is a big part of this. What is the minimum someone should start saving? Is this more of a strategy for this, what you're talking about, or is it just a strategy in, in life in general? Oh, just uh, in life in general. People can say whatever I do is crazy or they can love it, but either way, they should be saving money. I would say at a minimum, you should be saving at least 10% of whatever you earn. One of my favorite books is Richest Man in Babylon, and and, uh, he has a mantra that I just love. A portion of all I earn is mine to keep. And we forget that. And so if we're not saving for ourselves, then we're not going to get ahead, right? And I I have another great article that we could share with people that says what you save matters most for most of your life. And here's what I mean by that. Let's say that somebody makes $50,000, right? That's about the average. East Coast makes a little more than the Midwest, but let's just say 50,000, right? And you can save $5,000. So now your account is up $5,000. And let's say that that goes out and earns 5% interest. So your interest went up by $250, but next year you can save another $5,000. So now you've got 10,250 and then now that's going to earn 5%. It takes about 20 years before your interest even starts to break even on what you can save. And so that's why I say saving matters so much. Unfortunately, we've put so much pressure on rate of return Mm. that we've taken the pressure off of ourselves to just be good savers. And so it's going to be much easier to save your way to $100,000 than to take $5,000 and grow it to $100,000 without any additional contribution or effort on your side. So saving, yes, whether they work with me or not, saving is absolutely fundamental to preparing for retirement and being prepared. When opportunity knocks, it's those that are prepared that get to move forward, not those that are unprepared. Yeah, it's really unfortunate in our education system that we're not taught more about finances, about money, about how money works. As far as, you know, for the parents that are listening, for the men who have children, what could they be doing as far as educating their children as far as finances go and really taking ownership of the money that they have? I've got three kids, so I'm broke. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> children are expensive, but they're also sponges. And maybe it's because I'm in financial education, but I'm very open with all three of my children. And they range from age four up to age 10. Mm-hmm. From the time they are babies, I've been very open with them about money, both good and bad. How much is the mortgage? What does it take to run our household? How much are we saving? I don't go into significant detail because they don't understand the numbers, but I want them to understand, don't spend the whole dollar. If you earn a dollar, put some of that aside. And my my children are all very good savers because of that. But first and foremost, you've got to be the example because no matter what you say, they're going to do what you do. And that example is a silent testimony of how you're living your life all the time. And so if you're a good saver, but they have no idea, then they don't learn the lesson. 
But if you talk about it and they see that and you see, okay, hey, we saved up for a vacation. I tell my kids all the time, hey, I saved up this money. I paid for our vacation to Puerto Rico for 10 days. It may cost this amount of money. I put it on our Gap visa and I got $500 in reward gift cards. And then I paid the whole thing off, mm. right? So, I, I mean, I'm just very open with my children mm. about that. And then I go pay for their clothes at Old Navy and Gap. <laughs> but so I think just having that conversation. And then as far as mom and dad go, start to read the books. We've stopped reading as Americans, unfortunately, and we need to get back to that. There's no financial education happening in America. I graduated from the David Eccles School of Business at the University of Utah, and I only got financial training because I was going into finance. Mm -hmm. But even then, it's how do you sell stocks and mutual funds and bonds, and how do you do a 20-year projection? It's not basics like how do you save and live within your means? How does compound interest work? If I'm able to get compound interest and I save this much, What does it look like? I mean, most people don't realize if a 30-year-old is saving $500 to $1,000 a month at 5%, by the time they're in retirement, they're well over a million dollars. But unless they can see it, they go, I have no idea how much money I'll have in the future. So they don't save the 1,000 or the 500, and then they go out to eat or they buy a car that's more than they should. So I, I just think if you don't have a vision for what the future can look like, it affects your present Mm. and you don't become as disciplined. If you can't see where the money will end up, then people end up not putting the money aside. So I don't know if that helps answer your question, but those are just a few of my thoughts. Yeah, absolutely. And I like the quote that you have in your book, going back to parents sharing with their kids about financial education is the best way to teach your children about taxes is to eat 30% of their ice cream. (laughs) Oh, yeah. Yeah, That was the the actor Bill Murray uh, said that. You know, I've always been curious about money. All six of my books, I believe I've quoted my scout master. Um, (laughs) He was a a wealthy but frugal and disciplined man. He taught Mm. me a lot during Boy Scouts when the other boys were tying knots or shooting basketball or whatever. I was asking him about money questions and he would, you know, go play with the other boys. He'd get a little bit irritated. But then when I was in college, I had the opportunity to work for him and he really sat me down and walked me through good financial principles. And and that had such a positive effect on my life. Stephen, any last words that you'd like to share about this wealth building, keeping more money in our pockets for listeners? I would just say it's not as intimidating as you think. Once the light bulb turns on in your mind, the math makes a lot of sense. And controlling your money makes a lot of sense having a financial tool that can cover your life if something were to happen to you, that legally avoids taxes, that's guaranteed to never lose money and has grown every single year for over 170 years. I think that's worth learning about, if nothing else. But it's not as intimidating as people would think. And I'm happy to sit down and walk through the numbers with people or they're welcome to check out my book, or I could point them to a a dozen other books to get started on. Or if they're a little bit more advanced and along in the process, I could share some more advanced books with them. But educate yourself, have fun with this, and then just start working your plan. And you'll be shocked at how much it grows in a short period of time once you put a plan to paper. Well, outstanding. Thank you very much, Stephen. Once again, everyone listening, Stephen Gardner, author, Taming Wall Street. Stephen, one last question. How can people get in touch with you? What's your, what's your web address? How can people get in touch with you? Okay, great. And I just want to thank you again for having me on as a guest today. If somebody would like to learn more about me or about what I do, you can visit yourbridgeplan.com or they can reach out to me at 888 888- Six three eight zero zero eight zero. All of the books are available on Amazon. If we wanted uh, for the first five listeners that reach out to me, I'd be happy to send them a free copy of the book. Outstanding. Once again, it's yourbridgeplan.com. Awesome. Thank you very much, Stephen. And for all those listening, I'm Anthony Treas from strongmancoaching.com. And until next time, 
stay strong. Do you want to be a strong man? Are you ready to thrive and start living your best years yet? Visit strongmancoaching.com today and get ready to thrive. Disclaimer, the contents of this podcast is for informational purposes only and is not a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your healthcare provider with any questions you have regarding a medical condition.